Hello and welcome, chess fans. This is International Master Keaton Kira, and I'm excited to be doing a new video series for you guys on one of my favorite openings, the Trumpowski attack, which is known to insiders simply as the Trump. So that's d4, knight f6, bishop g5. So before we dive in and start talking about Trump theory, first of all, why play the Trump? What's so good about this opening? Well, in this day of cutting edge theory, this is a way to kind of sidestep some of that a little bit and play an opening that's more plan oriented and has great potential for attacking and creativity. This is a move that shakes up the game from the very beginning, boldly defying the principle of developing knights before bishops. White is claiming that by playing knight f6, Black has given him a target, and he should hasten to go ahead and bring his bishop out and target that knight. So white is playing aggressive from the very beginning. Now, this is one of those openings that if you really um, put some time into practicing it and, and looking at some games, that you can develop a very strong understanding of this opening and it can become a pet line for you, like it has for me and Grandmaster Julian Hodgson, who played this uh, line religiously, and for a lot of other very strong players. And that will give you an inherent advantage over your opponents who have spent all their time memorizing Nimzo Indian or King's Indian or Grunfeld theory or whatever opening it is that they play when they play um, knight f6. In fact, I've noticed uh, from my own games that uh, certainly I've had a lot of success playing the trump, and especially against very talented young players who are incredibly strong in theory, but maybe their chess experience hasn't um, given them quite enough situations in positions uh, like the trump uh, for them to know exactly how they should handle the position. So let's go ahead and dive right in. And um, we'll start with one of Black's most common responses, which is knight e4. Now, knight e4 is kind of a fun and provocative way for Black to play back at the trump and say, okay, well, if you're going to move your bishop right away, I can break opening principles too, and I can start by moving my knight uh, twice right, right out of the gates and um, put the pressure back on this bishop. And so this is kind of an enjoyable way for Black to play against the Trumpowski because Black's playing interesting creative chess. But as Trump players, it's also what we like because this is one of the, uh, the richest and most fun lines. So I believe the best move for white here is bringing the bishop back to f4, and now we're ready to play f3 and go ahead and kick this knight away and start steamrolling the center. So black has two main moves here, and those are c5 and d5. And c5 is going to be our main focus for this first video, it is worth mentioning that black has kind of a third wheel in this position, and that's this funny looking move g5. Uh, but I believe that g5 is very well met by bishop c1, 
where we can just return our bishop comfortably to the starting square, which is actually a pretty common idea in the trump, believe it or not. And here, black has really done nothing more than create a, a huge weakness for us to attack and put pressure on. And it's going to be very hard for black to ever get away with castling kingside in this game. So we're in fact threatening f3, driving back the knight, and then claiming this pawn on g5. So um, we'll talk about d5 in the next video, where I believe the best response is f3 followed by e4. But for now, let's focus on c5. So after c5, we should go ahead with our plan of playing f3. And it's been discovered that the most promising move here for black is queen a5 check, throwing in this intermediate check. Um, knight f6 used to be the more common move, but here after d takes c5, white gets a very promising Sicilian type position since um, his d pawn is going to be traded for the c pawn, so it actually becomes very much like a Sicilian. But I would say a good Sicilian for white, where after e4, this queen on c5 is a bit misplaced. And white has this very simple Sicilian plan of playing queen d2, castling quickly, uh, maybe playing knight e2. And then depending upon how black wants to play it, like let's say, for example, black plays it in dragon style, um, white can play it like a Yugoslav attack by playing for h4, h5. And also he has this move bishop e3, tempoing the queen anytime he wants and can even play for knight e2, knight f4, or something like this, where the knight has kingside attacking potential and can get to the d5 square. So this position is very promising and fun to play for white. So black normally inserts the check after f3 if he knows what he's doing. If he doesn't know what he's doing, then he probably plays knight f6. But if he knows the line, he's going to play queen a5 check. So here, white would play c3. And now knight f6, and the point is that by forcing the inclusion of c3, black has prevented the knight from coming to c3, and white won't be able to get one of those Sicilian-type positions. So um, here, I'd say rather than taking on c5, d5 is the most promising move to take the central space. Now, in the trump, it's very common when this dark square bishop moves early that black will play queen b6, targeting this pawn on b2, which is inherently weakened by the bishop's move. And in some positions, we can actually sacrifice that pawn, but I wouldn't recommend it here. White has a very nice move, bishop c1. <laughs> See, I told you a lot of times the bishop comes back to his starting square. I wasn't kidding. Now, you might say, wait a minute, this position looks good for black. He's developed two pieces, and white doesn't have a single piece out. But has black really made useful developing moves? The queen on b6 is more an eyesore than anything else. It doesn't have any useful targets. It can easily get bounced by some knight a3, knight c4 maneuver. And uh, the knight on f6 doesn't have any targets either since white's controlling all its important squares. And white simply wants to play e4 and then maybe even e5 and just bounce that knight. So I would say that Black's, um, his lead in development isn't anything to write home about, and that White's central space is actually more significant in this position. If Black wants to play for development, his only chance to do that is to play e6 and try to create confrontation in the center. Because once White catches up in development, White's just going to be better because of his lead in space. So after e6, I think the best move is e4 to go ahead and support this pawn. And now after an exchange of pawns, black would normally develop his bishop with something like bishop e7 or bishop d6. Bishop d6 is more ambitious, but also a little more clumsy because you block the d pawn and then turn this bishop. But it's more ambitious like to try to create some kind of pressure on this diagonal and also to leave the e file open for a check from black's rook as soon as he castles. But here, the most common way for white to play is c4. And now after castles, white's just in time with, for bishop d3. This position is actually quite a spectacle. Here, black has made four developing moves, and white hasn't made even one. It kind of feels like, wait a minute, what are we doing? But actually, after bishop d3, 
white's position is completely solid because blacks um, scattered, albeit developed pieces, really don't have any coordination here. And there aren't enough weak points in white's position for black to do any kind of promising attack. Rook e8 is simply met by knight e2. And here white's going to continue by castling, by playing knight c3, and maybe solving the problem with this b2 pawn by playing b3 so that white can develop the bishop. And black's development lead is going to be for naught in just a few moves. But white's lasting advantage of space is going to torture black for the rest of the game, making this position easier and more enjoyable uh, to play for white. So I hope that you have enjoyed this intro to the Trompowski attack and that uh, you'll come back for more videos.
Hey there, everyone. This is International Master Keaton Kira back with my series on the Trompowski attack. And so in this video, we're going to discuss uh, d4, knight f6, bishop g5, knight e4, as we did last time. But after bishop f4, since last time we covered uh, c5, today we're going to focus on d5. Now, there is uh, another move here that you might see, and although I don't take it very seriously, I just want to um, bring, bring your awareness to it so that it doesn't come as a complete surprise, and that is occasionally here, black plays g5. But I'm not a big believer in g5 for obvious reasons. It's a little bit unprincipled to, um, to move this pawn, even if it does gain a tempo. And I think the best way for white to take advantage of this is actually to return the bishop to its starting square. I told you guys last video that we see that sometimes in the trump. And um, here the danger for black is that white wants to play f3 and kick the knight and then take this pawn. So I believe that this pawn on g5 really just becomes more than a weak, more of a weakness and a target than it is really a, a strength in this position. I don't see much um, attacking potential here for black. So let's take a look at d5. So this is a very solid move, fighting for control of the center. And the way I recommend playing against this move is uh, similar to the c5 move. I still like f3, driving the knight back to f6. And here, we're not going to hold back e4. Let's go for it. Let's make this uh, push and really try to accelerate our development and our central control. Now, black can um, take on e4. And here, the best move is knight c3. So we are gambiting a pawn. But if you guys know anything about the black mardemer gambit, we're getting it a full tempo up and a good tempo at that. So the black mardemer gambit would be this exact position only with our bishop on c1 rather than on f4. And the black mardemer gambit is considered an okay opening, although maybe a little bit suspicious, but um, having this full extra move and a useful move at that, this bishop on a very good square on f4, I believe it changes the evaluation from suspicious to promising, and I fully recommend playing this position. I've played this position uh, before for white, and no one has ever been uh, brave enough to um, actually accept the gambit against me. So any of you guys who are watching this video, if you play me uh, sometime in the future, I challenge you, go ahead and take this pawn against me. Let's go for it, and I'll try to prove enough compensation for white. Now black can take on e4 and then decline the gambit with e3, but I recommend instead of taking the pawn immediately with the bishop to play queen d3, and the point is that here we're not wasting time, we make a useful queen move where we can take the pawn with the queen, and then next move we're going to castle queenside. But the most common way of dealing with white's e4 move is actually for black to play e6 and play the position like a French defense. And so here it makes sense for white to play e5, kick the knight back to d7, and here to play bishop e3. And the idea is that if they ever play um, f6, we can meet it with f4. Or really we want to play f4 even if they don't play f6. And as often is true in the French, we meet the c5 push with c3 simply stabilizing our center and trying to claim an advantage because of our lead in space. So I want to show you a game here that I played with white against Ru Feng Li, who is a very strong young grandmaster, although at the time we played this game, he wasn't a grandmaster. He was, um, this game was a few years ago when he was a promising junior, I think probably rated around 2300, a pretty strong master at the time. Um, and Ru Feng played c5 against me, and I played c3, so he continued knight c6, and I played f4. And there are some games that Kasparov played in a simul 
um, in this position that are well worth uh, looking at if you can find them. So C takes D4, and I took back with the pawn, and here knight B6, possibly with the idea of coming into C4. So that's why I developed with knight D2 rather than knight C3, which is what I normally would play, um, but I wanted to keep an eye on that C4 square. So Rufang Li developed his bishop, so I played naturally knight F3, bishop E7, and here I played bishop E2 instead of bishop D3. Bishop D3 looked a little too risky to me because of knight B4, and then if I want to preserve the bishop, I have to come to B1, and then when I saw he would play bishop B5, I ended my calculation here and was like, no thanks, this looks like something I don't need to deal with. So I played bishop e2 so that if he plays knight b4, I can simply play a3. So okay, rook c8, I play rook c1 to try to control the file. We both castled, and now knight a5, again trying for that c4 square. So I played b3, and now after a6, he's trying to bring the bishop to b5 to trade off that bad bishop for my good bishop on e2. So I prevented that also with a4. And so the knight on a5 has no purpose. It came back to c6, where it can try to go into b4. But now, in order to play for a kingside attack, I brought my bishop to d3, and after knight b4, now I dropped it back to b1, since my king is castled and the b5 rolled, so I don't have to worry about black's previous plan. So he traded the rooks, and now here played a move I found a bit surprising. I was expecting queen c8, uh, trying to play for the end game, but instead he played knight c8, keeping things a little more complicated. So I played queen e1 uh, with the plan of swinging my queen to the king side and trying for an attack. And after b5, that's exactly what I did. I played queen g3, sacrificing the pawn on a4 in order to play queen h3 and threaten mate. Now here, black has to make a tough decision. He has to play either g6 or h6, but they both kind of have their flaws. If you play h6, that pawn can easily be sacrificed on. If you play g6, you're weakening the dark squares and allowing moves like queen h6. So it's kind of like pick your poison, and Rufeng played h6, which after I analyzed, I felt was a little less accurate, but I can understand why he played that. So I took on a4, and he played knight b6, and now g4, time to open the floodgates. So he took on a4, trying to claim that extra pawn, but now f5, and white's attack has arrived. All the pieces are in position. So he played bishop c2 and f6, no holding back. G takes f6, and now I took on h6. And after knight d7, I traded the pieces. And here there's more than one way for white.
fight to win, but if you'd like, you might pause your video here and try to find a strong attacking continuation for white. So I was pretty pleased with the finish uh, to this game. I played knight to g5, threatening mate, and forcing the pawn to take the knight with the idea of clearing the way for a rook lift, rook f3, followed by rook h3, where checkmate is almost unstoppable. So Ru Feng Li, even then a resourceful defender, found the best chance. He played rook e8, but I played rook h3, playing for the mate, and then he played bishop f6, thinking, okay, if I take with the pawn and he takes with the queen, maybe black's position is not bad. But my idea was to take on g5. This is a dark square deflection idea, very common in my pet line of the Sicilian dragon, to try to distract that bishop from its job and give mate on the dark squares. So Ru Feng played queen b6, trying for some counterplay against my open king, but unfortunately for him, it's just not there. After queen takes d4, I play king g2. And so knight, after knight e3 check, now I take with the queen. And black resigned because um, rook h8 mate is threatened. So queen takes queen isn't possible. And queen takes pawn on g4 is met by rook g3, pinning and winning black's queen. So the reason I wanted to show you this game is to show how the Trompowski offers a lot of creative attacking potential and how a lot of the positions are relatively unexplored, but you can still use ideas from other openings as I did with the dragon here um, to try to put together some sort of creative and aggressive plan. Hi there, everyone. International Master Keaton Kira here with you for another video on the Trompowski attack. So in the last two videos, we talked about the starting move order where after Bishop G5, Black answered with Knight E4. But now we're going to talk about a close relative of Knight E4, which is C5 on move 2 because c5 is very often used in conjunction with um, knight e4, but there are some subtle differences when black plays it right away on move two. And uh, there's a line that gave me a little bit of trouble here in my games when I would play d5 in this position, which is the most common move. And twice here, people played against me g6. And they said, okay, well, you decided you didn't want to take the knight on the first go around, since after c5, bishop takes f6 is a very common move. So they, using that logic, they were thinking, well, I'm probably not going to take the knight here. And if I do, they wouldn't be too upset. They take with the e pawn. And since I moved the pawn to d5, their bishop along this diagonal would make a lot of sense, since they could push the pawn to... Um, f5 later on and um so i had to think about how i wanted to play this position and uh the first time i had this position for white it was against my uh my kryptonite grandmaster jeffrey zhong and i i just can never uh beat or get a draw against jeffrey zhong he just beats me every time we play i mean he's a really strong player and he's supposed to beat me like pretty much every time but i feel like he still beats me um a lot even for being as uh as much higher rated than me as he is and he he beat me with the black side of this line and then also Grandmaster Alejandro Ramirez, probably after seeing that game, he decided to play this line against me, and he almost beat me too. He had an advantage with black. Um, I ended up escaping with a draw in that game. But after those two games, I said, you know what, no more. I don't want this position again. And I decided to learn the move Knight C3. And as a Trump player, when I learned this move Knight C3, 
that um, transformed this two uh, C5 line from being probably the line that I dreaded the most to being the line that I was the most excited to play against because I just love this position after knight c3. Now, if black plays queen b6, which is an idea we've talked about trying to target this weak pawn, this pawn that's inherently weakened when we put the bishop on g5, here we can transpose by playing d5 and getting a much more favorable version of the other line because in those positions where I played d5, if my opponent played queen b6, I happily played knight c3 and got to this position, which is known as the Vaganian Gambit, and it's one of my favorite positions to play. We uh, cheerfully gambit this pawn on b2, and um, we bring the bishop back to d2 to guard the knight and to reap the fruits uh, that we've gained from giving up this pawn. So white is actually threatening here to win the game by playing rook b1, forcing the queen to a3, and then playing knight b5 with an unstoppable threat of knight c7, since our bishop denies black's queen the a5 square. So black, in fact, has to go ahead and go back with his queen. And here, after playing e4, white has monstrous compensation for the pawn. White's already threatening to play e5, white's ahead in development, and has huge space in the center. And a little bit of a disclaimer here, if you don't like this position for white, you probably shouldn't be playing the trump, because this is about as good as it gets. So after d6, uh, f4 is a very strong continuation, and we have all these ideas where we can play knight f3, try to play for e5, we can mix in bishop b5 check, we can throw in rook b1, and uh, white usually just has a field day in these positions. So the move that's probably a bit more challenging to knight c3 is taking on d4, Although um, I would call this a different kind of challenge and certainly one that I embrace because as we talked about in the first video after queen takes d4, this position has transposed into somewhat of a Sicilian since uh, the d and c pawns have been exchanged. So now after knight c6, this natural developing move, we can bring the queen to h4, which is a very promising square. And here our plan is to put the pawn on e4 and castle queenside and play it like a very strong Sicilian since we have an active position with the bishop on g5 and the queen on h4 and we'll have a strong rook on d1. And I just don't see much that's not to like about this position. Um, so black will usually play here something like d6 or e6. e6 is probably the most common move. And here it's good to play e4 and prevent black from playing d5. And so now breaking the pin makes a lot of sense with bishop e7, and white always wants to castle queenside in this line. And here d6 um, is a normal move to prevent white's idea of f4 and e5, although f4 is the best response anyway, and white's idea now is to play e5 because of the pin. So black needs to figure out what to do with his queen. Queen a5 is a very normal response. And here in knight f3, we bring the knight to a good square and renew some possibilities of playing for e5. And I actually had this position uh, in the pro chess league against a strong fide master named Yannick Cambrath. And uh, Yannick Cambrath played h6 here not really with a threat since the pawn is pinned to the rook anyway, so black's not threatening to take the bishop. But after h6, I played um, queen h3, and now after rook g8, breaking the pin, I traded on f6 and brought the knight to d2. Strange looking move and strange looking position, but my idea is clear to target this weak pawn on d6 by playing knight c4. So after knight d2, bishop takes c3, I threw in an intermediate move, knight c4, 
And after taking on b2, I took with a king, and so black gave this check, queen b4, but here I played queen b3, actually embracing the end game, since I thought it was going to be good for white, since black wouldn't be able to save the pawn on d6. And here the game got pretty interesting after king e7. So my move here was knight takes d6. And now black played rook d8, pressuring my knight. And here I traded the queens and played e5. And I feel like white has a little bit of an advantage here. It's an end game with equal material, but white has more space and an obnoxious knight on d6 that's a real pain for black to have to deal with. And I went on to win this endgame. So long story short, I think that if black plays um, c5 on move two, knight c3 is a great response, which leads to either a Vaganian gambit or a, uh, a fun Sicilian type position where white has a lot of good attacking potential. Welcome chess fans. This is international master Keaton Kira continuing with my series on the uh, Trompowski attack. So now after um, d4 followed by bishop g5, we've seen knight e4 and we've seen c5. And these are black's most ambitious responses where black is trying to create a fight early in the game. Now, I want to take a look at what happens when black um, settles back a little bit and plays some more conservative, solid kind of moves. So this video is dedicated to e6 on move two, which is one of black's most solid responses and certainly something that you're likely to see from a Nimzo Indian player who's used to putting that pawn on e6. So here, white has a few good options. So one is to play e4, and this is the most common response where we're taking control of the center and we're immediately threatening e5. So normally black would play h6, forcing the capture on f6, since if the bishop moves away, black can play g5 and claim an extra pawn. So bishop takes f6 is the move here, where black would take back with the queen. And here, uh, white has a couple of good options, uh, known respectively as the Yusupov line and the Pert system. So the Yusupov line involves developing both of the knights out to f3 and c3. So for example, if knight f3 here, then the next move is knight c3. d6 is a pretty common move here. And so here, let's say, for example, knight c3. And here there are some different ways black can play. He can actually go g6 and try to fianchetto the bishop, or he can even go g5 and try to do the same. And very often, this Yusupov line, white plays for something like bishop d3, queen d2, castles long. And the position looks very promising for white, except that he has a little bit of a problem in that he's missing his dark square bishop. And sometimes white can have some weaknesses on the dark squares or find it a little bit harder to attack uh, with the knights as opposed um, to having that dark square bishop. So that's the only uh, thing that can be a little bit problematic for white in this line. But I think the position is still um, very playable for white as he has a strong center and good development and a lot to play for. So that's the Yusupov line. Now, in this position, after queen takes f6, white can also play the pert system, which normally starts with c3, solidifying the center. 
And here White's development scheme is to put the bishop on d3 and to follow up by bringing the knight to e2 and then castling kingside and pushing f4. These are the main ideas uh, behind the pert system, which is a, uh, a very solid system. And this knight could then come out to d2. And in these lines, white completely owns the center and um, can play for e5 down the road. Again, the only problem that white can really face here is that lack of a dark square bishop uh, from trading that bishop off so early. Um, so there are some good options against uh, 2e6 that don't involve trading that bishop, if you guys prefer to keep the bishop. And one would certainly be putting the knight on f3 with a transposition into a Tory attack that you would get, like, for example, if you started from d4, knight f6, knight f3, e6, and then bishop g5, a well-known Tory attack. And white can transpose into that position, uh, which is very comfortable. The main thing that black is doing now against the Tory attack is playing something like uh, bishop e7, and then white might continue e3, and black would get castled. And here, black is often playing for this early c5, and then after white's standard c3 response, black would... Um, trade pawns in the center quickly, defining the position, and then continue kind of like a hedgehog by playing something like d6 and then b6, fianchettoing the bishop. And very often this kind of position is reached. And if white plays a4, black wants to make sure to play a6, otherwise a5 is a very powerful positional pawn sack to open the a file. But black should play a6 here with the idea of meeting a5 with b5. And um, this is a pretty good um, fighting position. I've played it many times myself for white, um, usually with pretty good results. I, I did have one uh, pretty bad loss in a rapid game to um, Grandmaster-elect John Daniel Bryant, my uh, San Diego Surfers teammate. Um, but other than that, I don't think I've lost too many games from this position and i've beaten some good players i beat grandmaster uh alex shamanov from the white side of this position uh, so i'd say in general it's a good fighting position pretty solid for white and pretty pretty comfortable if you want to transpose to this tory um, but there's another idea that tries to go for the same tory plan um only under a little bit more of a favorable circumstance and I want to show you that idea, and that is to play on move three, knight d2. Now, knight d2, since we have one idea to go ahead and play e4 uh, and have that pawn protected, it definitely prompts black to strike the center quickly with something like c5 or d5. So we're usually going to get into this kind of position, and in these positions, we're never really worried about queen b6 because we can just go rook b1 and the black queen is pretty silly out there on b6. So here, depending on how black wants to set up, black has some flexibility because he could put his bishop on either e7 or d6 and he could put his b8 knight on either d7 or c6. So black has some options, but white's main plan is to play bishop d3 and then if he can, try to sneak that pawn to f4 before he plays knight f3 so that he can even put a stronger bind on the position and uh, have more potential for a kingside attack. So let's say, for example, black plays knight c6, we play bishop d3 and bishop d6, for example. Now, if black had taken earlier... Um, we would probably want to take with the e pawn and then not really worry about playing f4. But in this position, I think f4 is a very good idea. And the plan is to immediately sink this knight on the e5. For example, if black plays to fiend Keto as bishop, since d7 is not a very good square, we can put that knight on e5 right away. 
And if they take on d4, we could take either way, but I prefer taking with the e pawn, which is the standard capture in these trump positions. Uh, we don't that way we don't give up b4 for their knight. And here the knight is very well solidified on e5. Um, it's almost always bad for black to take. And we can simply castle and start playing for a kingside attack with something like queen f3, queen h3, playing for mate on h7. And even we can play g4 in these positions if we need to. It could become kind of like my game against Ru Feng Li that I showed um, in the second video here in the Trump series. So... This uh, this plan can be uh, very annoying for black to meet uh, in these kinds of structures. One of the more common ways of dealing with this kind of plan is to play, to try to put black's own knight on uh, e4 as quickly as possible. And for doing that, black would have to use a different setup. So probably he would want his bishop on e7 right away in order to break that pin and then he could set up by maybe after castling to try to play um, b6 and to quickly play for something like bishop b7 followed by knight e4 now in this position if you want to play for the same plan of knight f3 and knight e5 that's a hundred percent fine but I want to show you a little bit more solid plan that White has here too. And that is that he can put his queen on f3 in order to keep complete control of the f4 square. And so it looks like, well, now what are we going to do with this knight? But this knight actually has a pretty good home on f2. We can play knight h3 followed by knight f2. And we have complete control over this e4 square. So black will never be able to claim that square. And then we can still play on the king side by playing something like g4 and starting, or even queen h3, and starting to mobilize a strong attack. So that's a second option here that you have in this position. Hello and welcome everyone. This is International Master Keaton Kira back with another uh, video on my Trompowski series. So last time we saw e6, one of these very solid moves that black can play. And there's another one where black can play here d5 and immediately fight for control of the center 
and ask White what his intentions are. Does White want to take on F6 or does he want to try for one of these other schemes like bring the knight to F3 or the pawn to E3? Even though it's completely playable, I'm not the biggest fan of knight F3 because here Black has the option knight E4. And if you remember from the second video in the Trump series, when Black uses the plan of knight e4 and d5, White's main idea is to play for f3 and e4. And here we can't do that because we've got our knight on f3. So even though this position is completely fine for White, if I believe um, bishop f4 is probably the best continuation here. Um, but still, it's not really my cup of tea. So I will show you guys in a minute what I like to do here. But first, I want to talk a little bit about taking on f6, which is certainly a viable option. So here, Black has a choice as far as how he wants to take. He could take with the e-pawn, giving scope to his bishop. And here, the best plan for white is to play e3 and follow that up with c4 trying to create some kind of exchange in the center. And if black takes with the um, G pawn, then here the best plan is to play C4 immediately, striking the center. So when I was first learning these lines, it was a little bit of a problem for my memory. I was trying to think, okay, well, on which one do I play E3 and on which one do I play C4 right away? I was a little bit confused. And uh, the way uh, I thought about it that worked for me is that if black captures with the e-pawn, you're also moving your e-pawn. So if that helps you, go for it. So if black moves his e-pawn, you move your e-pawn, so the move there is e3. And if he captures with the g-pawn, that's where you want to play c4. But knowing these different ideas against the trump that I know, I settled on something that I thought was a little more creative, and I decided that my favorite move to play here is e3. Now, if black plays something like e6, then we can play knight d2, and we're right back in what we saw in the last video, where if black goes c5, we go c3, and we're back to this plan of bishop d3, f4, knight f3, knight e5, a plan that I feel very confident uh, recommending. It's a, a very strong plan for white. Um, so we would be very happy to get that position. So what black has to be ready to do after e3, and not everyone is going to um, play like this, is to play c5. So c5 is a move here of someone who studied this position and knows their theory because it's not really a conservative player's move to go c5 in this position. But if black's well prepared, it might be something that he does. It's a pretty good antidote to the plan I just showed you because they're immediately pressuring our pawn, making it so that we don't really want to play knight d2 because then they could take and play queen b6 and they have targets. This would not be the most ideal position. So in this position, we would want to play c3, but here black has an annoying idea, queen b6, where really the only satisfactory way of guarding this pawn is queen b3. Because if we play b3, there's a lot of weaknesses. They can play knight e4, and they have pressure on our bishop, and they have pressure on this pawn, and it's not a great thing to get into. And if we play um, queen b3, they can provoke us to capture the queen either by playing knight e4 first or by playing c4 right away. Because here, if we go back to c2, which is kind of a common idea in the London system, sometimes, well, I was going to say we have to watch out for bishop f5, but actually we don't because we can take it, and they can't take on b2 because we give them mate on c8. So actually, we don't have to watch out for bishop f5. But they can play, um, they can play knight c6 and... Actually, now they're threatening bishop f5, and then they can try to play on the queen side after that. So um, what I recommend is after c5, 
now transposing to this line where we take on F6, and this is going to cut back on our workload because here we've basically eliminated E takes F6. Black can play E takes F6, but it's not good because we play D takes C5, and here we get black in a very awkward isolated pawn position with this isolated pawn on D5, and white has everything that we want. We have, uh, we've traded off our dark square bishop, which is our bad bishop in this structure. We've kept our good bishop, and we have the knights, which tend to be strong in the isolated pawn position, so we can play knight f3, develop the bishop to a good square, maybe on e2, get castled, and then maybe put the other knight on something like d2, b3, and d4, and make a blockade, or we could play knight c3 right away and start attacking the pawn, and it's a positionally awkward uh, position for black to try to play. So the only serious move after bishop takes f6 in this line is g takes f6. It's the only move that really makes sense because it leaves black structure intact. So this position I don't have a ton of experience in, so I thought who better uh, to refer to than the world champion himself. So Magnus Carlsen had this position in round one of his world championship match in 2016 against Sergei Karyakin, and Carlsen, handling this position for white, played D takes C5. So Karyakin responded with a developing move, knight C6, and now Carlsen played bishop B5, immediately creating a good fight by pinning that knight. So here after E6, white continued with C4, D takes C4, and now knight D2, declining the queen trade and moving the knight to where it's ready to capture back this pawn on C4. So Karyakin claimed this pawn on C5 with a developing move, but now simply knight G F3, and even though Carlson is temporarily down the pawn, it's a sure thing that he's going to get back this pawn on c4. And also black um, has to make some decisions about his king since it wouldn't be altogether safe on the g file after he's played this um, g takes f6 capture. And also in some positions, this pawn f6 can be a little bit of a weakness with ideas of white's knight coming into e4. So here... Um, Black did, in fact, decide to castle kingside. And white also castle kingside. And so now knight a5, trying to preserve this pawn or at least exchange some pieces. But Carlson continued to keep up the pressure here with rook c1. And now after bishop e7, queen c2, still not taking that pawn, but putting even more pressure. So Karyakin offered a trade of bishops. But there goes Black's two bishops' advantage, one of um, his proudest aspects of this position. So, okay, takes trades on d7, and now queen c3, pressuring this knight. And now, after queen d5, knight takes c4, the pieces were exchanged. Everything was traded on c4. And, okay, at the world championship level, Black was able to hold this position, and make a draw, but from a practical point of view, it's not so easy, and I think white's having the better game here because um, black has no targets for his bishop. There's no targets in the white position, and there's no active plan because white owns the C file, and white can double the rooks anytime he wants. He can try to put the rook on C7, and black has no point of entry into white's position. There's nothing on the D file because D2 and D1 are so well covered. And after white plays rook C1, he has the plan to play king F1, king E2. And the white king is completely controlling the D file. So Magnus Carlsen did manage to pose um, his opponent some practical problems, but it wasn't too big uh, a task for the minister of defense. Karyakin was able to, um, to hold a draw in this ending after a little bit of struggle. But nevertheless, 
I think um, this way that Carlson played is a very good way of, uh, of posing problems to Black in this position. So I hope you um, enjoyed this video and the ideas made sense and see you uh, next time for more Trump videos. Hello and welcome Chess.com members. This is International Master Keaton Kira and we will continue with our video series on the Trompowski. So white plays d4, black uh, plays knight f6, a very accommodating move, and now we play our bishop out to g5 where it has some purpose here uh, due to the knight on f6. I will just mention uh, briefly there's an opening called the pseudo trump where after d5 white plays bishop g5 and i get asked a lot as a trump player my opinion on the pseudo trump and my opinion is that it's okay um but the bishop just doesn't make quite as much sense on g5 to me without the knight on f6 so i don't play it but it is a, a playable opening and if you want to uh dabble in it you know, and see what you can learn, then then go for it. It's it's not it's not a bad line, um, but I only play uh, the pure trump. So bishop g5 here after knight f6, and uh, today we're going to discuss every King's Indian and Grunfeld player's favorite response: pawn to g6, since this is the move they're used to playing on move two, and uh, we have a couple of good options for playing against this line. Um, and probably the most promising option is to go ahead and capture this knight and uh, compromise black's pawn structure. But I do want to mention before we get into that, that white can also play knight f3 here and transpose into a uh, Tory attack, which is um, a very promising way, too, of handling this kind of position. So bishop g7 would be the main move. And here we can play knight d2 with the idea of playing e4. And this prompts black to play d5, since if he goes d6, here e4, this would be a king's Indian position like no player for black has ever seen before, because there's no pawn on c4, the knight is on d2, not c3. And so this is almost more like a perk or a modern, and something that a king's Indian player could be very uncomfortable with uh, because white has this plan of playing bishop d3, putting the queen on e2, and pushing e5, and it's, it's not that easy for black to meet. So more commonly, black would play after uh, white plays knight bd2, black would play d5 in order to uh, prevent e4, and now here white can play e3 like a standard Tory, and then very often castles. And here I believe that bishop e2 is normally a little bit better than bishop d3 in this structure, because I don't feel like bishop d3 makes a whole lot of sense with the pawn on g6. It's kind of aiming at a wall. And uh, also in the positions where 
the black pawn hasn't come to d5 yet, one thing that we have to be a little careful of when we play this structure with the pawn on e3 and not on e4 is that in some positions with the black pawn on d6, black could play for e5, followed by e4 and trying to fork our pieces when our pieces are set up this way. So that's something we need to be a little bit careful about in these fiend keto positions. So I think normally in these positions, the bishop's a little more comfortable on e2. And then here, white wants to castle. And if black ever plays c5, white can play c3 and solidify that uh, pawn on d4 and then try to play for knight e5 in, uh, in typical fashion. So this is certainly um, quite a legitimate way to play, but I think g6 offers us an opportunity uh, to compromise black's pawn structure, and I would recommend taking it. So I like this move, bishop takes f6, forcing black to recapture with the e-pawn, and then playing e3 in order to solidify our center, and what I'm going to recommend here um, looks a little bit strange because after we play e3 and black naturally plays bishop g7, the next move is actually g3 preparing to fianchetto the bishop. And so here, if d5, for example, we could play bishop g2, black might castle, and then we develop the knight out to e2, and uh, black could play f5, freeing up his fianchetto bishop. So in this position, we have an interesting imbalance where black has the two bishops, but his pawn structure is a little bit compromised. And uh, I think white should be pretty happy with the way this position has turned out because white's kept his best bishop, which is the light square bishop on g2, and we see here all these white pawns on the dark squares. That means that the light squared bishop is the good bishop and the one uh, worth keeping here. And it can coordinate pretty well with the knights in this position. The, um, now, when we play bishop g5 on move two, we don't want to get too attached to that bishop because one of the main ideas of the Trompowski is to trade off that bishop for a knight at the right time and then put most of the important pawns on dark squares, creating a kind of structure where we're actually glad to be rid um, of the dark square bishop. So in these positions, the main strategic idea for white is to try to get in c4 in order to uh, fight for central control. So after f5, white should complete development, let's say castles, for example. And now here, if black moves the bishop, if he plays bishop e6 or something like that, white can play c4 immediately, and there is tremendous pressure on black center. Black can't play d takes c4 because of his pawn on b7, and here white can follow up with knight c3, putting even more pressure on the center. So very often... Very often in uh, this position, black would play c6 in order to solidify his center. And here, if white were to play c4, black would cheerfully take the pawn and white would be hard pressed to demonstrate compensation for it. So white needs to prepare c4 a little bit better. And there's a couple ways to do that. You could play b3 right away, or you could play knight d2, which is a pretty natural developing move, preparing to play c4. And then if black tries to slow that down with bishop e6, for one thing, knight f4 is a very common theme in these positions. Sitting on a, a good square where it has constant pressure on this bishop. And in such a position, you don't need to take that bishop. For one thing, you could argue that the bishop on d3 is a big pawn, not really worth trading the knight for. Um, but also just having the possibility of taking that bishop in any favorable moment, it makes um, that tension is very annoying for black. If every single move he has to look over his shoulder to make sure that white can't take that bishop advantageously. And also with the knight on f4, the only real way to kick it is to play g5. But that, of course, is a move that's very risky for black 
as it creates a lot of weaknesses on the Black King side. White could respond by capturing this bishop, uh, by moving the knight back to a good square on d3, or even bringing the knight into h5, which can be a very good square where it pressures Black's dark square bishop, which is certainly the better of his two bishops in this position. So um, after bishop e6, we could play knight f4, but even we can also play b3 in this position, and here black is powerless to stop the c4 advance. If black plays b5, we could even play rook c1 and then c4, among other things. So let's say that black makes a natural developing move. Well, now we play c4, and black is kind of between a rock and a hard place because if he takes on c4, he's giving up central control. And if he doesn't take on c4, then we have the potential to be able to take on d5 and create a target there on d5, which we can then attack with our pieces. So black would likely continue here with knight f6. And here we can continue to build up the pressure on d5. Or in some situations, it's even fine to play c5, b4, a4, b5, and just kind of storm the, uh, the queen side and try to win the game over there. So this is the plan um, that I believe is the most effective against this g6 line in the Trumpowski and the plan that I believe gives black the most problems. Hi everyone. This is international master Keaton Kira with uh, the final installment of my series on the Trumpowski. I know, I know everyone's heartbroken, um, but I figured what better way to cap off the series by showing a couple very interesting, very decisive uh, wins uh, for Wyatt in the Trumpowski. So there's a very famous game that some of you may be aware of. It's actually an ultra miniature. An ultra miniature is a game decided in 12 moves or less, whereas a miniature is a game uh, decided in 23 moves or less. So this is an ultra miniature where the player on the losing end was almost a world championship candidate. I'm talking about legendary grandmaster Alexei Shirov. And the player who beat him is an English grandmaster who actually wrote a book on the Trumpowski named Peter K. Wells. So Peter Wells played d4. And then after um, Black played knight f6, played bishop g5, he went for the Trumpowski. And uh, here, Shirov decided to play c5 which is the line that we talked about in the second video in the series. So after c5, Peter Wells played bishop takes f6, which we talked about certainly as an option, although I recommended uh, knight c3 here instead of bishop takes f6, going toward the uh, Sicilian-type position or ideally a Vaganian gambit. So bishop takes f6 was played, and Shirov recaptured with the g-pawn. And so Peter Wells played d5, and now queen b6, not too surprising, trying to attack our Achilles heel, the b2 pawn. So white played queen c1, and now f5, c4. And here Shirov played an interesting move. He played bishop h6. So white played e3, and now f4. So the idea is that when we take on f4, which is what uh, Peter Wells did, Shirov's intention is to recapture with his bishop, distracting the white queen from this b2 pawn. But Peter Wells uh, had an interesting sacrificial idea, and he actually played queen takes f4, allowing the capture on b2, which traps white's rook, but he decided simply to play for development here with knight e2, and now after queen takes a1, knight c3. And even though white's down some material, he has a great position because this black queen is trapped out of play, 
And there are a lot of targets in the black position, not the least of which is the black king stuck here in the center on e8. So after knight c3, uh, Shirov attempted to withdraw his queen by playing queen b2, but here black played very aggressively with d6. And now a big threat of queen e5 attacking both the rook on e8 and mate on um, e7. So Shirov responded with uh, queen c2 with the idea of meeting queen e5 with queen c1 check and trying for some counterplay against the king. But Peter Wells avoided that by playing queen e3, threatening mate, and Shirov actually decided to resign in this position, a decision that was uh, mystifying to um, a lot of the players. And I apologize, this actually wasn't an ultra miniature, it's 13 moves. I was thinking for some reason this game was 12 moves, but eh, actually missed by one, so not quite an ultra miniature. Um, so why did Shirov resign? Well, I think it wasn't so much that he was losing right away as that he is just disgusted with his position because after he plays something like e6, there are these queen g5 possibilities. White just has so many good options. He can play for queen g5 or he can even play more calmly with bishop d3, kicking the queen away, probably back to this b2 square. And then white can just castle. He can enjoy himself and he still has all these ideas in the air like queen e5, like queen g5, like knight b5 coming into c7, or knight d5 coming into c7. White's position is just an embarrassment of riches here. And um, it, it sounded like Shirov uh, resigned just because he was so disgusted with his position. Now, after this game was played, Shirov was asked um, in an interview if he was aware that his opponent had written a book on the Trompowski, and Shirov kind of shrugged off the question, saying that perhaps he should have read a beginner's book before this game, which is kind of funny because, indeed, the only piece that Black has out is his queen, while all his other pieces are back and his king stuck in the center about to get checkmated. Yeah, so it's, it seems like maybe a, uh, a beginner's game, but this is just proof of how... Um, the Trompowski can make uh, even some of the strongest players in the world look weak if they're not ready to face it. So now I want to show you another great um, Tromp game, and this one was played by English Grandmaster Michael Adams. The Tromp is very popular in England. It's played um, a lot by the English players, um, not the least of whom is Grandmaster Julian Hodgson, who's considered probably the most feared and the most knowledgeable Trump player in the world. He's been playing the Trump as one of his main openings for, for many, many years. So in this game, Grandmaster Michael Adams was playing white against Peter Laco, and he played d4. And so Laco responded knight f6, and now we know it, Adams played bishop g5. So, okay, Laco played knight e4. Bishop f4, and now c5, the line that we talked about um, in the first video. So white played f3, knight f6, and now just like we talked about, knight f6 is very well met by d takes c5. So this game was played in 1996, when probably this move queen a5 check wasn't yet known. And now queen a5 check is known to be superior to knight f6. And Adams showed why. So after uh, knight f6, he played d takes c5, queen a5 check, knight c3, and now queen takes c5, e4, and g6, trying to play it like a dragon. So Adam said, okay, if you're going to play the dragon, I'm playing the Yugoslav attack. Queen to d2, d6, and now castles queenside. So here, Laco continued with the most natural bishop g7. I'm starting to feel like maybe this game belongs in my dragon video series. So bishop g7, bishop h6, challenging the bishop, castles, and then h4. It's like one of those Yugoslav attacks that just plays itself. Bishop e6, h5, 
Knight takes h5, which every dragon player knows is very risky to open that h file for white. So now bishop takes g7, king takes, and g4, kicking the knight back. The knight has to go back to f6 to guard this pawn. So now queen h6 check, king g8, and now simple development, knight from g to e2, supporting the other knight, and eyeing some good potential attacking squares. So black played queen f2, trying to infiltrate into white's position, but much like the uh, Shirov game that we just saw, this queen looks kind of painfully alone here deep in the white camp. So Adams decided it's time to uh, turn the lights out. E5, attacking the knight. Rook C8, since uh, taking the pawn would allow knight E4. Yeah, knight E4 is the key idea. Forking the queen and the knight. So if the black queen moves away, white would take the knight and give mate on h7. And if knight takes e4, it's mate on h7. So e5 is actually winning a piece. So after e5, black played rook c8, giving up the piece. But after e takes f6, it's quite hopeless. So after e takes f6, Michael Adams played knight to d5 with huge threats of knight e7 and knight f6. So bishop takes d5 is forced, but here after queen takes h7, king f8, queen h8 check, the rook on c8 is lost. So king e7, but now queen takes rook on c8, and Adams is winning by a full rook. Queen takes f3, rook h8, threatening mate on the back rank. So Leiko threw in one last desperate spite check, queen e3. But after king b1, he resigned. And it's like, come on, couldn't he have just, remi couldn't he have just resigned one move earlier so that the game would be a miniature? Here, this game was just uh, one move too long for a miniature. The game before was one move too long for an ultra miniature. I'm just kidding. But this, um, this was an interesting game and a very decisive one at that. So I hope very much that you guys enjoyed um, these great Trumpowski games. And I hope that you uh, enjoyed the series and that you'll give the opening a try and have great results.
Let's have a bit of fun till I downfall. My love, if you feel like I do right now, don't say you're on the run to the other side. My love, you say you wanna try, but you never do. Sugar, there's a reason why we live. 